Um, and he's the ED and founder of Canadian Centre for Men and Their Families. Now, Justin's work has been to help men um, claim equality, uh, have equality. And they, they have something called CAFE, Canadian... Uh, blah, blah, blah. Association for Equality. The Association for Equality. And he, like I said, he's a new kid on the block, so we're not used to having him around now. By this time next year, we're going to be so used to having <laughs> this, this group with us. So, and we're, they're doing so much really good things for men. And men, you know, let's face it, in terms of the abuse and in terms of trauma, they've really been underserved. So we're really happy and proud that Justin is, being, is spearheading this, this new group. So I give you Justin Trotting. Thank you. Thanks so much, Lynn. <clears throat> is this thing on? Okay. Uh, this isn't amplifying, it's just for your purposes. Is that right? Okay, great. So uh, thank you, Lynn, uh, for that introduction. And I guess I'll just start by calling up my co-panelists, uh, Brad and Anne. Would you care to join me? And as they get settled, I want to uh, reiterate my comments from last night for those of you who weren't here. As the new kid on the block, I'm just so pleased and, and honored to be a part of this conference. Um, working together, the four co-hosting organizations, it's been a real pleasure uh, to get to know uh, the staff uh, and the leadership of each of these three organizations that we've uh, had the privilege of working with. Um, the only quick comment I guess I wanted to make, just to provide a bit of context and uh, out of my own sort of personal uh, stake in, in this particular panel, uh, is just to speak a little bit about the Canadian Centre for Men and Families, and in particular, our uh, interest in, I guess, really broadening our areas of concern when it comes to things like trauma, domestic violence, uh, and sexual abuse. Uh, just a few months ago, I think it was in March, actually all three of us were part of a presentation to the Ontario government. There was a committee that was looking at uh, sexual harassment and violence. Uh, and what could be done to improve the resources that were available to, to victims uh, and their families. And their mandate was to find ways of uh, dismantling the myths and misconceptions surrounding uh, violence. Um, and one of the major uh, barriers that they identified were stereotypes that were held by society that made it hard for all victims of violence to get support. And I remember that one of the um, one of the statements that was made sort of as part of the mandate was that uh, violence comes in all ethnicities, all ages, all socioeconomic status, um, that all, all groups, uh, the individuals, regardless of those demographic characteristics, can know violence. Well, we went to the panel, all of us, to say that it also knows no gender and no sexual orientation. And that's one of the themes I hope we can get into on this panel. Uh, it does span all genders and all sexual orientations. So we're going to talk about what I would describe as non-stereotypical or non-traditional scenarios of violence, um, trauma and sexual abuse. Uh, we're going to talk about uh, women as victims, victims of male perpetrated violence or victims of violence perpetrated by other women. And we're going to talk about, again, male victims, both of violence perpetrated by other men. Um, and in terms of sexual violence, we heard about that last night. We're also going to be looking on this panel at domestic violence, where uh, men are uh, victimized by, by women. And we're going to be talking also a little bit about violence in, in same-sex relationships, because that also is quite a taboo we don't, we don't talk very much about. So with that, um, sort of overview of what I'm hoping we can get into as we try really to break down those barriers and those taboos and talk about things that don't get a lot of attention. Uh, I'm going to start by introducing my two co-panelists, uh, Brad Hutchinson of The Gatehouse and Ann Lee, who runs a trauma survivors meetup group. And I'm going to ask them to uh, speak uh, for as, as long as they'd like, um, just by way of introducing themselves and their work um, and their thoughts um, on, uh, on, on the conference theme. Um, I will ask them to try to keep their comments on the shorter side because I will have some questions and I hope we can get into a conversation and then welcome questions from the audience. So let me start by uh, introducing Brad. Brad is the executive director of The Gatehouse which is a community organization providing support, resources, and services for those impacted by childhood sexual abuse. Um, he works with both male and female survivors. Uh, he's also an avid community advocate involved in restorative justice, 
Uh, he's worked with the youth, Associated Youth Services of Peel. He was chairman of the Mississauga Library Board. He's been involved in many organizations in his community, for which he's won an Ontario Volunteer Service Award uh, from the Honorable Charles Sousa, uh, Ontario Minister of Citizenship and Immigration, I guess at the time. So uh, thank you so much, Brad, for joining us on the panel. And we'll start with your opening remarks. Is it okay if I uh, don't use this? <laughs> I'll try to. Um... Uh, do you, you want me to turn this off? Or? No, no, that's fine. Oh, okay. Um, I just I can't really hear you. Yeah, I'm going to turn my voice box on. Oh, I see. I'm uh, struggling a little bit with my voice, so I need okay. a little amplification. Does that help? Does that work? Uh, well, as long as you can, maybe, can you hold the mic for it? And I don't do very well talking sitting. So I'm one of those people that need to move to think. Um, thank you, Justin. A long time ago, can everybody hear? Thank you. I'm, uh, you're okay? A long time ago, in a very, very far off land, a child was born. Like his father, his grandfather, and his great grandfather before him, he would belong to the warrior class. And he would be expected, like his lineage, to rise to the leadership of that warrior class. As he moved through his education and his training, it became clear very soon that he would far surpass the achievements of his ancestry. By the time he was 18, he was on the battlefield, leading thousands, thousands, tens and thousands of people into war. And in his training, the spiritual, mental, emotional, and physical training, he really gravitated toward that spiritual peace. And he took in all that information and he moved into that darkness of war, knowing that what he engaged, he could transform. And what he engaged with the light of his mind and his heart would be transformed forever. By the time he was 28, <clears throat> the need for war, had ceased in the land, and peace reigned because of his efforts. And he was moved up into the upper echelons of society, and he wanted for nothing. He enjoyed the best of everything, of entertainment, of pleasures, of everything. The only thing that diminished during that time was his happiness. And this question plagued him over and over and over again. It kept on popping up when he was asleep into his consciousness, demanding some resolution. And he, and, he, and he fought it, and he couldn't understand why, after all he had achieved, that he was experiencing this lack of happiness. Then it came, the calling from the high spiritual master up in the mountain. This was an honor given to almost nobody. And he would be allowed to ask one question. For the next three days, he made that arduous trudge up the mountain, fending off animals, sleeping in very difficult conditions. And then he arrived on this plateau, and there was an old man at a table, behind which snow-capped mountains and a house. And he rushed up to this old man, and he was so excited. He said, Master, Master, he could not control himself. What is the difference between heaven and hell? The master looked up, his, his eyes turned up, and they turned scornful, hard. He stood up and he said, you idiot, you dare to come here and disturb my tea? You're not the warrior I sent for, you are weak. I can see you're weak in mind, in spirit and emotion. Get out of my sight, and with that he spit right on him. Rage blurred this person fishing. He had never been spoken to. He was praised. He was strong. He led the land to peace. How dare this person insult him that way? His hand moved over, closed upon a sword. He pulled out the sword, swung it around his head. The only thing that this man before him deserved was the release of his life. And as the sword came to his neck, the master's eyes turned gentle, soft. He said, this is hell. Before the blade hit the neck, he realized what he was about to do. He was about to cut off that spiritual part of the, of the lessons that he learned that carried him all the way up here. 
because of an emotional outburst, because of anger, because of his ego. He wasn't defending the land anymore. He wasn't defending peace. He was defending his ego. With that, the blade fell to the ground. His knees met the ground, and he cried. His heart completely opened, and he was vulnerable, and his humility showed. He had never been vulnerable like this before. He had never allowed himself like this before, and he understood that there was only one course of action right now, was to look into that, be completely open, and say, great master, I lost sight of my purpose. I almost cut off the spiritual intelligence of the land, of the people, because of my small ego wanted revenge, retribution. I stand here before you, Master. I'm sorry. Please forgive me. And the Master and I turned gentle again, soft, and said, Ah, this is heaven. We all, all of us, we all have four parts, and we heard it very eloquently today so far. We have a spiritual part of ourselves. We have a mental part of ourselves, an emotional part of ourselves, and a physical part of ourselves. What happens when somebody is assaulted sexually, especially as a child? Two things happen. First is the loss of voice. The second thing that happens is a thrust off that purpose. I believe we do all have a sacred path inside. We all have this path if it unfolds naturally. Our emotions, our mind, everything in alignment. We get the education we need. We have the emotional resilience we need. And we move out and we move that creative energy in the world. See, what I like to do is I like to play in that spiritual part. <laughs> That's where I like to learn. That's where my path has led me through my hardships and my struggle, my climb up that mountain, has led me into the spiritual realm, which happened to land me as a director of the gatehouse, somehow, some way, where I'm able to bring some of this wisdom that has been taught to me to people at the gatehouse. And what the gatehouse is, is a peer-to-peer -peer support system for people that have been harmed by childhood sexual abuse. We have programs, an investigation program for children, and we have adult support pro programs for men and women. And what we do there, and what we like to say we do there, is we do nothing, and we do nothing really well. And Arthur Lockhart, the visionary of the gatehouse and of this new kind of way of looking at um, sexual abuse, especially with children, and how to heal those wounds, whether whatever stage you're at with that, whether you're a child that it's happening in the investigation piece, rather than taking that child down to the police station where it's cold, the child already thinks they're doing something bad, they take them down to the police station, re-traumatize that child. So the gatehouse, which you're all invited to, I know many of you have, have been to the gatehouse and are part of it, part of our family, there's an investigation room that's filled with teddy bears, and that is warm and comfortable. The videos are taken, and then they can use those videos in court, so the child never has to appear in court. So the investigation process is part of the healing process, not a re-traumatization of the events. And we know that's true, because when children leave, and Paula, our child advocate and family support person, Children often say, is this your home? When can we come back? So they're not looking to leave. So we know that's a testament to the work being done by the investigators and the child welfare people. The adult support programs, we do just really what that story illustrated in many ways. We go back through a process, a peer-to-peer -peer process, and go back through that darkness again, go into that darkness and help be the light that pulls them out, that pulls them through. Our, our, our groups are facilitated by volunteers that have been through our groups for the most part. So there's people going through the darkness of the inner child, for instance, the three weeks of that, where it can get pretty heavy. And then there's somebody in the group that says, 
Me too, I know. You're okay, you're gonna be fine. In that darkness, we find our light and we find the love that's in there. And I heard it earlier, it's that love that's always there. The darkness can't snuff out that light, but the light can surely shine in on that darkness and open it up. The abuse never goes away, but instead of it being a controlling force on the inside, it's there beside you now, not controlling the behaviors on the highway, not controlling the behaviors when they rise up. And we do a lot of mindfulness. My history is in Shaolin Kung Fu, which is why the warrior story. <laughs> That's what I've been doing for 20 years. I've been fighting in that darkness of understanding conflict. Understand when somebody punches you in a sparring situation, that that's not about me. When you can move to that level, that it's not about me, it's about something wrong with the connection in that person's spiritual, mental, emotional, and physical balance. You can stand up and say, this is wrong. No. And then there's no shame attached to that. There's no guilt. It's a lot of work. It's a lot of work. We have programs. Phase one is men with women, men, and women with women, different night. And then we have a phase two with men and women together. I specifically talk about the effects of sexual abuse. Now, of course, our men's programs are bigger. That's because there's not many programs for men. Hence, uh, Justin's group comes along and says, hey, there's a, there's a gap here. And that's really important work. It's really important the community comes around and says, hey, we need support here. We need to do something differently. I think it was Einstein that said, if we keep doing, the definition of insanity is if we keep doing things the same way over and over again, expecting different results. <laughs> well, it's not, it's pretty insane. The gatehouse is just over on the other side of the, the buildings there, the college. Our programs are free. They're for, and they're always gonna be free and, and that really it's hard to we're always grant writing and looking for money and all of those kinds of things because we know that we these need to be community run arthur's vision when he started this program he had hundreds of people in a room and said we're going to have a program where children can come tell their story become healthy and strong and not be re-traumatized by the events and they, the, the crowd went crazy he said this is a great idea and he said we're going to have a program for women Adult women that have been affected by childhood sexual abuse to come and tell their story, heal and become strong again. Lukewarm, well, aren't there other programs for women? Like, should we really be focusing on that? And he said, not like this. Then he said, this is going to be a program for adult men who have been sexually abused as children to come and heal, reclaim their voice and be strong again. And there was silence. And then the the the... The, the comments came, you can't do that. You can't put men who are abusers in the same house as women and children. We won't support that. The money that we said we were going to give you, we won't support that. And Arthur, in his very gentle and nice way, he said, thank you for sharing. Oh, and that was in 1998 the medical community, which we have so many great connections and there's a lot of clearly very good people in that community, said at the time, you can't run peer-to-peer -peer programs for people harmed by childhood sexual abuse. You can't open that can of worms. You can't, you, you don't have the qualifications to handle that. And Arthur in his way, very nice way said, oh, well, thank you for sharing. And he did it anyway. Now, all these years later, most of our referrals come from the medical community because we're starting to see that peer-to-peer -peer support, as we heard earlier, is so important. It's so important to sit beside or in front of somebody that maybe is on the other side a little bit, but is still up here. In the balance of, <clears throat> I'm almost done, my voice is almost done, so you can be thankful that... <laughs> 
in the balance of the abuse, there's a power structure there. Even the best doctors and nurses and therapists, there's also that sense of the balance and sense of power. And that's really important sometimes. That's really important to have that because it's really important to have somebody that knows about that to help bring you through. But what's also really important in that healing process is to have a community of peers to help you. And not to boast, but to boast, the Gatehouse has one of the best peer-to-peer, -peer, I would say the best that I know of peer-to-peer -peer process on the planet. <laughs> And that's largely because Arthur Lockhart and his energy are pretty much all because of him. If you get a chance and you're all invited to do his facilitator training, it's a two-day training, over the weekends, we do them four or five times a year, do them. It teach, he'll teach you grounding techniques, how to be in the world, how to be grounded, how to be in the world where that spirit can rise up. I was really taken when Ellen was saying that her faith <laughs> was not diminished by somebody within the face, faith. And I think that's really powerful. I think that's that spiritual path. When you lose it, getting back on it and saying, well, you're not cutting off my spiritual path. I can do that. And everybody, and we've, there's over 15,000 people have been through the gatehouse, can move closer to that spiritual path. It's a lot of work. And if anybody wants to come to the gatehouse, find out more, have a tour, we're happy to, to bring you along and, and be a part of our family. And I'll just leave it at that and let any questions come up after everybody's done speaking, if that's okay. So thank you all. I'm just gonna introduce Ann. Right, I'll provide you a brief introduction. Do you want me to provide you a brief introduction before? Uh, sure, if you want. Okay, let me grab the mic, I'll okay. be very quick. <laughs> Okay, so thank you, Brad, for um, sharing those uh, words of wisdom with us, despite the, the trouble with, with your voice, which, by the way, is the result of sharing your wisdom in so many speaking engagements. So you're a hot commodity, and we welcome you here. Um, I'm going to introduce uh, Anne Lee. Uh, Anne is uh, a retired IT professional. She's had over 20 years of experience working in the health and financial industries. And uh, more recently, she has, for the last six years, been the uh, leader of the Toronto Trauma Survivors Group, uh, which is a meetup group which uses, uh, quote, emotional martial arts as an approach, which I thought Brad would also enjoy hearing, um, and creates a safe space for survivors to regain their strength and to find their voice. Anne. Oh, it's stuck. Thank you, Justin. Um, I'm, let me start off and say I'm not a public speaker at all. I facilitate a group, but I don't do this kind of thing. So, so uh, um, I'm a little off my game, so please, I hope you'll bear with me. Um, the, uh, the focus here is on um, men and trauma. Um, and we were t we've been talking a lot about um, sexual abuse, but trauma is so much more comprehensive than that. Um, and I think one of the things, one of the things that concerns me is that, uh, first of all, I'm very happy to be here, and I'm so happy that, that this initiative is taking place. However, I really resent that this initiative has to take place because I think um, in the conversation today, we've largely pathologized masculinity and I don't know why, I think it's, it's really, um, I find it really troubling um, because in my own life, um, if it weren't for uh, the men in my life, I probably wouldn't be alive. Um, my abuse was um, very violent and it was from my mother and it's not uncommon and that kind of experience doesn't have a place in any of the existing services and I, I'm really grateful to, to Justin and CAFE for giving me a place to talk about it and I think it's important to talk about it for a couple of reasons. One is that everyone is happy to talk about violence against men as long as the perpetrators are men. Um, you know, when I, I, I might go out and ask all of the men here, how many of you have been given the the impression 
that just because you're male, you are capable automatically of being a rapist, murderer, assaulter. So, you know, if anybody's comfortable, hands up, you know. So are there any men who haven't received that message? I think there's something really problematic with that. Um, the, the world needs both masculine and feminine approaches. If you don't like that, you can talk about yin and yang. But I think um, the characteristics that are traditionally male um, of strength, protection, forbearance, um, even stoicism in adversity, those are all really good, positive things that we all need. They're human values that women need as well. I think the world needs that. And it concerns me that we've laid all violence at the feet of men. And I think because of that, and there's a whole lot that goes into it, um, you end up pathologizing men, and then men are an afterthought in mental health treatment. Um, so I think that uh, it's really important to use both the yin and the yang, if you like. I think both are important for healing, both are important for um, getting through trauma. Um, and as, as a, so, so and one of the other things that concerns me is most of the approach to trauma treatment over the last while um, and the uh, and the language tends to be more feminine. So I wanted to, um, a couple of things. I'm losing my point, sorry, as I said, I'm not, <laughs> this is not my area of strength, but um, uh, Daniel Siegel, um, I don't, probably a lot of people will know him. This is what he says about, um, this was his advice to parents of traumatized children, but I like what he says about tra trauma. Trauma is like a dog bite. When a dog bites you on the fingers, it's maybe a little graphic for people, so I apologize. When a dog bites you on the fingers, your natural instinct is to pull your fingers away, and unfortunately, that will create more damage to your skin. What you really need to do if a dog bites you on the hand is thrust your hand into the dog's mouth, which makes the dog gag. Now, I know it's very graphic, but it's the same thing with trauma. Again, he's talking to parents here. Parents need to know it's important to go into the trauma, into the mouth of the trauma with your mind and with your relationship with the child so that it doesn't dig its teeth in and yank the flesh of your soul away. Um, now, that's very different than a lot of the language around trauma healing, which is about acceptance and meditation. And, but really, a lot of trauma is interpersonal trauma. It's assault. Um, and the notion of protection is critically important. That tends to be, um, a, 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 and I think protection is, is a characteristic that everyone needs to embrace, um, protecting the vulnerable. But I think we've lost that. Men seem to have lost the, been, have lost the permission to protect um, the weaker around them, to protect each other, to protect themselves even. And so I'm hoping that we can just right size all of this. Um, the other thing I like, uh, so, so our group, um, we started off with PTSD and trauma in our uh, URL. I don't like either of those terms anymore. So I, I much prefer another, this is another Daniel Siegel quote. He talks about terror. Um, so, and I think trauma has just become so wishy-washy that it's just anything and every, um, and really we're talking about ter terror, fear of death. And, but as I said, if we called ourselves the Toronto Terror Group, <laughs> that wouldn't go over very well. So, um, so I, I think it's really important that we use correct language. And I've lost my note. Um, so I'm just, gonna, uh, I'm just gonna wander here a little bit, sorry. Um, oh, before I continue, by the way, I was really surprised and pleased to see um, Torque and Mains um, as the sponsor of here. Um, so I, pu I put up a, I don't know if I should have, but I put up a, cu a couple of reference articles. Torque and Mains represented the complainants in this case, um, and it's the Edith Sa Sanders case. And I am shocked, like I'm sh shocked and dismayed that no one in Ontario has heard of this case. This is, um, if there's, uh, so what I had wanted to talk about was partly female sexual, um, female sexual abuse, which people don't believe exists, 
Um, and I wanted to talk about what I call the great white shark of female sexual offenders, which are the predisposed typology. Um, but lo and behold, th this case, um, which is the best example I could ever come, come up with. Um, so I've left a couple of references examples there. If anybody wants, I can send some links. Um, and and if, if you look at this, this should put to rest. There's so much information about female violence that doesn't get onto the record anywhere. If it did, if we honestly allowed that to, to, um, to just be known, this whole notion that all violence is male would disappear. Um, but the truth is, you know, and, and even, um, some of you know cafe's information here about the um, the reciprocity of domestic violence. Um, in here, we talk about uh, domestic, emotional, physical. It's also true for sexual, but no one no one wants to look at it. And 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 unfortunately, what I found researching this that isn't well known is that there are a number of people who have written about, researched about um, female, sexual female, female sexual violence, female sexual abuse that are, um, it, there's, there's an atmosphere of denial, intimidation, harassment. I've known people who've tried to write about it, who've had death threats. I've had threats. So um, it's, it's, it's a difficult thing and it, we need to add it into the conversation. And I know it seems strange to be talking about women in a men's conference, but I think it's important so that we get the balance to realize that, um, you know, as, as, um, as Lynn said yesterday, and, and w as we say in our group, anyone can, can be an abuser, anyone can be a victim, and that's regardless of gender, that's regardless of race, etc. And I think that's really important. Um, and I have, I, I won't go into it because I think I'm taking too much time, but I actually have, um, I, I interviewed a woman who's been working with sex offenders for years, and it's been so well known in, in, the, in the community of clinicians who treat male sex offenders. So when we talk about sex offenders, we default to, when you use the term sex offender, we default to the notion of male sex offenders against women, and never even question our language that there are male sex offenders against males, there are female sex offenders against females. There are female sex offenders against um, against men. And but we we use this, these default assumptions that just reinforce the um, the prejudice basically and the and the misinformation. My background is in IT. My husband and I. By, by, by the way, my husband runs the group with me. Um, our background is in IT, um, data integrity, data governance, and I can tell you that there is so much gatekeeping and um, bias in the way we collect information through criminal convictions that the statistics are useless. The statistics are meaningless. And when you look at the difference between victim reports and conviction reports, it's night and day. So people of integrity need to really look at that. So um, and I'll just finish up by talking about Daniel. He's one of the people in the group um, who's come, and um, in my group who's come, and I think his is a really instructive example of the complexity of trauma and the complexity of violence. Um, trauma does not fit into these nice, neat little categories. All of the services I notice seem to be um, largely set into these categories, and that doesn't actually match trauma survivors' experiences. So. D Daniel, I hope you'll correct me if uh, if I get anything thing wrong. And this is these are just the highlights. But um, um, and I should say that the people who come to my group I consider to be heroes. They are heroes. They are brave warriors um, who are trying to fight through really awful experiences. So, and I think just as an example of how trauma. And what happens to people doesn't fit into neat categories. Um, Daniel was born uh, a single mother, um, two brothers, 
two sisters, um, a mother who was probably assaulted, hated her, the boys. Um, um, so already there was that from the very beginning. Um, was left at the age of two with a babysitter who put him in a tub of scalding water um, where he was injured and he has nerve damage and scars to, these day, to this day. This is when his mother was, was away, um, taken by helicopter to ambulance, um, taken by helicopter to, um, to sick kids in hospital for, um, for a month. Um, but none of that was ever really acknowledged. Um, the, um, after that, his mother, who is abusive, would blame him for the abuse. So he's walking around with these scars already that, that there's a difficulty. Um, then his mother married a stepfather who, who really picked on Daniel. Daniel was one, um, one of the peop people, one of the children who was really targeted. Um, and then when he was older, to, to cover up the abuse, his mother had him committed. And um, th there have been a number of people in our group who've had experience like that, where parents will commit children, cover up abuse, or convince the children to commit themselves, um, which sets up a whole different thing. When he was older, he um, ran away to the street, which he found was safer than being at home with all of this other stuff going on but where he was raped twice by two different men. Um, one was a sadist. Um, he prosecuted the one man, um, and so through that, uh, the one who was the less violent perpetrator um, got victim status and got some, some, uh, um, some compensation for that and is now, um, you know, thanks to some the, the work he's been doing lately, is working to try and find and prosecute uh, the worst offender. Um, but Daniel shows up in our group every single meeting. He is the sweetest guy. He works so hard on his recovery. And one of the problems for him is that he's a big guy and, that, and he has so much legitimate anger that doesn't have a place to be easily expressed because automatically the assumption in society is that He's male, he's a perpetrator. And, um, and there is such a lack of sympathy and empathy for people. And I have other people, I have women with stories like that. And, and most of the people in our group have been, um, their offenders have been both men and women. It is not, um, it is very rare that we'll have somebody who will come in and who will be one gender and have only had one offender from another gender from another gender. Um, that is very rare. So, so the whole notion of re-victimization I think is so important that, that um, and if you look at criminology, people who've been offended against have a much higher percentage of being re-offended against. And there are all kinds of reasons for that. And if people don't tell survivors that, you don't know to look at and protect yourself. Um, so I think um, so I'm, I'm straying a little bit, sorry, I'm, I'm, but in our group, I, I'm hesitant to identify myself as a leader because the whole purpose of our group is, first of all, we're the anti-group. We are, we are not the touchy-feely group. We are face, trauma, head-on, whatever it is you call it. Um, we laugh a lot, um, critical of everything, and it's essentially about survivors talking to one another unfiltered. Um, and so one of the things we have is no therapy speak. So we say, we're not therapists, this ain't therapy. Um, and it's survivors' real voices. So, and what we ask people to do, we kind of, going back to the IT analogy, we're the QA. So, so people come in with all these theories about what they're supposed to do to heal from trauma. And what we ask for people is their genuine experiences. What has worked, what hasn't worked for you. And what we find is, and I should say, we've got a couple of subgroups. We've got a group for early childhood abuse. We have a group um, for child torture victims. Um, and child torture victims, by the way, there's a Barbara Knox, a Dr. Barbara Knox, who's trying to raise awareness of this. Child torture is predominantly female perpetrated. Um, in the studies that she's done, every single case is a female involved. So, 
so we need to start looking at that not to not to demonize women and to, to and not to demonize men and, and and we need to i think we need to change the separation by gender into who's committing violence who's a victim of violence um i mean it's not that easy because there are people who there are, there are people who've been raised to commit violence who don't know any better and need to be trained there are people who um, are predatory who enjoy violence, so there's a difference that way. But I think that's the really important consideration. The rest of it, you know, whether you wear something on your head, whether you, mm, you know, wear trousers or a skirt, how old you are, the color of your skin, all of that, I believe, is irrelevant. Um, there's a philosopher that I can't remember who said, you only make... Um, you only make a difference where there's a relevant difference. I think we've made, what I see in the services that are out there, largely, is that we've made these, um, these separations that aren't relevant to trauma. Um, and we really need to look at, um, in my opinion, what's important is people's pain, um, people's need, um, and everyone needs to be provided with an opportunity to heal and not be demonized for something that has nothing to do with, with what they're bringing. So, um, and I think that's true for men versus women. Um, sorry, for men and women. I think that when we when we we set up a divide between groups, that that doesn't help victims. It, it that's my belief. It really doesn't. So, anyway, I'm sorry to go on so long, but that's. <laughs> well, thank you, Anne. I think uh, the plain spoken way that you expressed your concerns and your, your feelings, I think that's the only way we can break through some of those barriers and taboos uh, that we've been referring to. I also want to thank Daniel for allowing his story to yes. be, to be yeah. shared. Did I, did I miss anything, Daniel? No. <laughs> Good. So I'm going to ask a few questions and try to get a, a conversation going with our panelists. But I also would like to open it up because we do have a smaller group. It's a little bit more intimate of an environment. So if anybody wants to comment, um, please, uh, I guess, just raise your hand and I'll try to involve as many of you as I can. I guess my first question, it's been alluded to already. It's in the breadth of the concept of trauma. And Anne, you mentioned uh, you weren't sure if that was even the right word. So I wanted to start there. In terms of trauma, how, how do we define it? What's in, what's out? Um, and is it appropriate, this has also come up already, to deal with all trauma together, or are there differences that require different approaches, whether it's sexual, physical, et cetera? Um, we start with Brad on that. Well, that's a big question. Um, yeah. um, I think trauma is, it, it depends on the effect of trauma, I think. I think there are two fundamental emotions that we have, love and fear. Whatever pushes you more towards fear and guides your behaviors based on fear, we need to deal with the trauma there. I think all trauma, I mean, there's difference between physical, emotional, mental traumas and how we make an entry point. But I think at the end of the day, if we move right to the end of love and that's connection that we all have on the deepest level of each other, I think we want to move that person that way. How you deal with that person depends on the individual person before you. So if that person is filled with anger and rage and, and, and that's coming towards you, you work with that, you deal with the anger. If, it's, um, uh, if they're turning inward, you want to pull them out a little bit. So I, I think it depends. I think trauma is trauma. It moves you on some part of the scale towards fear and towards love, and you have to meet the person where they are. That makes sense. Yeah, I, I'm in our group. As I said, I I, I tend to ask people. I learn from um, the members of the group, and we had an interesting thing because because our group we kind of call it it's kind of a garbage can group. So it's for everybody who wants in, doesn't fit anywhere else, um, and to think critically. 
Um, and so we get a range of people. So we get people with, quote, only emotional trauma and, you know, some people with full on torture. Um, and sometimes there's a tension in the group because people have been led to believe that, um, that emotional abuse is, is um, less relevant. So I, I, I did a, I kind of took a leap and I put something out and I thought, oh my heavens, this could blow up. But I was really surprised. I, in, in order to try and make the people with only emotional abuse feel a little more comfortable, I put out to the group and I said, okay, if you could choose, if you had you know, the people who've had, um, you know, repeated rapes, electrical shocks, I'll put my hand up to, this maybe a little gra bit graphic, but this is what happens. Um, electrical shocks, being forced vomited, et cetera, et cetera, et cetera, things like that. Um, wh so wh what we talked about, what led to this was people talked about the un unacknowledged harm of the small things that happen. Um, and and, uh, and we, we talk in our group about how um, and this came from Judith Thurman. There are actually three perspectives in what I call um, an assaultive transaction. There's the offender, there's the victim, and the observer. Um, and often, the way we describe trauma and trauma services is from the perspective of the observer. It doesn't work for the offender, it doesn't work for the victim. Um, and so, um, so, so and, and, and from the outside, we say rape is the worst thing, you know, or this is the worst thing, these, you know. But what we started talking about was this pervasive, so, so there's a difference between people who've had single incident traumas and people who've grown up and had constant trauma. Um, and, and what there is there is this pervasive sense of ongoing threat that you can never escape from. And, um, and it can be, you can be traumatized with just a look. There's just an eyebrow. There's something that lets you know. Um, and so I put it out to the group and I said, if you could choose, if you had to keep one and you could lose the other, if you had to um, either the, you know, the, 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 the statistically you know, significant assaults, the rape, the, all of the other things I mentioned, versus that ongoing sense of threat. If you could keep one and give up one, which would you do? And I was kind of shocked. The people in the child torture group, hands up first, right away, and said, we would keep the rapes, we would keep that, if we could get any sense of safety. Which says to me that um, we need to give more of a place for people to talk about what's actually harmful to them. Um, and, and really, and we, people have talked about love here, what they're saying, and it's not just love and that. That's where I think the masculine, we need to depathologize masculinity because what those children needed was protection. Um, and so even though, and a safe place to go to, and that could, that's both masculine and feminine, um, and this, this constant emphasis on the extreme things that the observer sees doesn't always match the victim. So I think it's important to allow victims of all types to start to say, what's been the harm for you? So I'm sorry, that's a long-winded way and I don't know if it answered the question, but. Does anybody else wanna speak on that? Okay, then I have a follow-up question because you just mentioned this idea of sa opening up safe spaces, providing safe spaces for people to open up. Um, and I wanted to now get into this issue of breaking down barriers for um, uh, survivors uh, with respect to different uh, non-traditional kinds of violent scenarios. And I'm wondering in your experiences if you've noticed that there are differences in how we create a safe space for men versus a safe space for women, uh, for gay people versus straight people. Does, does the concept of a safe space, is it, is, it, uh, is it general or are there different techniques and strategies depending on these kinds of considerations? Let's start with Anne this time. To be honest, I would like to learn more from men what they need because I think men tend to be quieter. It's harder to know. It's harder to get feedback to know if you're on the right track or not. Um, the, um, for gay and lesbian, one of the things that we, we changed something in our group and, and I said, 
because I got fed up. So, so one of our rules is leave group grievances at the door. But I got kind of fed up with people all coming in and, you know, lamenting about something else when there was another person of that group sitting right beside them. Um, so one of the things I put on there was we don't care if you're green or purple. We just care if you um, have experienced uh, um, trauma and you're not going to be an asshole about it in the group. And after that, we have quite a significant... Um, now, we had that before, but I think the, it, it's been an uptick since. We have quite a significant percentage of gay and lesbian and transgender people who um, in our group. So, I mean, I don't know if that's coincidence, but I think... Um, I think that as long as you're saying this is the part of you that's important here and the rest of it and your um, whatever your your identity or whatever is going to be respected and no and and no one will be allowed to to hurt you, hurt you because of that I th in in my experience so far that seems to have have allowed everybody to be in there so we have we have a number of different um, demographics so but I don't know um, it's hard to get feedback on that so it'd be interesting to hear from different survivors with their experiences but that's you know from what I see from my spot um, I would agree with a lot of that for sure all of that um, just when you know I like to send a white sweeping statement about the gatehouse how good it is and all that because I that invites no you're not <laughs> And martial artists, we're not all that bright sometimes, we send stuff out, but always in kindness and in heart. And when I say stuff like that, I mean it's because of you, uh, people like Justin, people like you and Lynn and everybody in the room here, and that is looking into these things. So for that particular question and for being here and sharing your energy with everybody, um, you know, so just when we're going along fine with, yeah, we work with children, we work with men, we work with women, gay, lesbian, we're doing good, we're getting lots of good reviews. Um, we get it when a, a trans person comes in and says, I wasn't greeted very nicely at the door or, or whatever, and you guys aren't doing well with this and blah, 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 blah. And what we do with that, we just say, oh, hmm, good, there's something for us to learn. So what we did with that, so I would say, um, n no, just because we're, we're learning how to create a feeling and space of safety for the trans community that feels very unsafe. Because I think in the gatehouse, and we, we, we're troubleshooting this, that we're missing a big part of the uh, population that's been traumatized by childhood sexual abuse. And how do we meet those people in order to, in that darkness, to help bring them through? So we had um, a placement student come, and now we're going to be involved and engaged in trans training. So now this person has brought somebody into our circle, and is now, and we have that training coming up uh, next week or two weeks from now, and we're going to now make that an offering. Does that mean we're going to be offering trans groups? I don't know, because it's, it depends on what comes out of that. So. I think there's a lot of room for growth in creating safe places for people. The most important part is to be humble and have that humility when somebody says, you're forgetting about me. You're forgetting about my needs and what I want. When you say things like that, you're not taking into account that that harms me. And our response to that is, oh, let's talk about that. Let's, let's, let's find out how we can create a safe space. Because we are all in this, we work on, at the Gatehouse, we work on childhood trauma of sexual abuse. That manifests in a myriad of different ways. And just when we think we're being so good, we know it's coming. No, you're not. <laughs> and which is enlightening and great, because I think we're at the very early stages of talking about a lot of things that have been hidden and kept in the dark for a long time. What we have to accept is that we're gonna stumble a little bit. We're gonna be awkward sometimes. We're gonna be, we're gonna make mistakes. And as long as we're able to be humble and say we made a mistake and we lead with our heart, I often say life is a journey of the heart that requires the mind, not the other way around. So I think if we're leading with our heart, mistakes will be accepted and learning will happen. So I think there's room for opportunity. 
I'm really glad you, you brought that up. And my follow-up, I guess, is just to probe a little bit deeper. Do, do you find that it's, it can be harder to get certain groups of people, and again, I'm, you know, that's a general statement, I suppose, but it, certain groups of people to open up, men, for example, is it harder to get to motivate men to open up or uh, uh, members of the gay, lesbian, or trans communities? Is there more sort of stigma um, for uh, those individuals to uh, speak up about their experiences? Again, because there has been less research or less public awareness or less services um, that have really catered to those communities. And then specifically, again, on men, this was mentioned earlier, but this, this notion that men are assumed to be the perpetrator in situations of violence, does that play a role, that kind of victim shaming, in a sense, um, that keeps men from being motivated to speak up? Again, a big question, I'm sorry. <laughs> uh, whomever wants to start on that. Yeah, I, ha I have to say that, that um you know, going back to, to Daniel, he's the sweetest person, but he has said that, you know, when he goes to, and tries to talk, that if there's any emotion at all, there will be an assumption, oh, you must be a perpetrator, and particularly, anyway. Um, and I do notice a couple of things. The, the language we use around mental health treatment and the approach and I, and I think maybe I'm more aware of this because I come from a business background and a non-traditional um, background so I always kind of feel impatient with some of the language and so I think it's first of all I think you can't have the same kind of space for everybody so one of the things we learned in our group was we have a personality, just have it stated that the people who want to use that, they'll come. And somebody who wants to have a, you know, a sort of a, a more softer, you know, more gentle approach, they'll go to a different group. We're not that group and that's okay. So you can't be everything to everybody. Um, um, for, I have found sometimes there are men who come and just listen and, 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 and I worry about that boundary because I've tried to, to ask what, what do you need? And I found that some men are okay with that. They're okay just to be there and be safe. But I would really like to have more information from men about what they need. Um, one of the things that we do in our group is I, um, personally because I found it more helpful, is I go to sources like um, the people who train SWAT teams. They talk about um, crime detection, victim selection. That's a more male kind of approach and it's actually really, I found it, really helpful for survivors who are ready to look at that. So I think, um, I don't know, I think we're, we're beginning on this journey and it's really important that we give a place for men's voices to, to come out and say what they need. And I think it's also really important to be aware that again with the yin and the yang women need that too so we for instance we had an example where a man came and he'd come through the standard anger training that they give to male perpetrators even though that wasn't his role and he said i'd like to share that with the group um, and he was looking to speak to other men all these women went we need problems with anger we have problems with anger nobody talks to us about problems with anger so i think it's i mean I think it's important to get everybody's voices in there, but I don't think it's just for men. I think everyone will benefit from that. But I, I'm not sure how to do it. I'm not sure how to do it without intruding on on you know men's um, men's boundaries. So if uh, you know the work you're doing to to try and and start this conversation is what's needed. Uh, I don't necessarily have an answer. I think there are. I think it's important to make sure it's added in. Vitally important. Um, again, another great question and, and great response. And I mean, again, asking for more feedback. I think, again, we're at a very early stage of this. In our experience at the Gatehouse, it is very difficult for men. Uh, whether that's more difficult for women or not, I don't know. Um, I think it might be a bit different. Uh, if, um, a man came in a few months ago, and our normal process is to greet them, offer coffee, uh, drink tea, whatever, and then to, if they're coming in for an interview to make, because they possibly might want to do a program, 
the idea is to get their contact information. And we asked them, would you mind filling this out? So he looked at this sheet of paper and he said, oh no, you called me by name. And just the fear of that piece of paper and putting the information down on that piece of paper, it sent him in, it triggered him into a um, anxiety. And he started pacing up and down. Oh my goodness, he, everybody's seen me now. I, I shouldn't have walked in that door. I shouldn't have done it. So in, those, in that case, I just put the, the paper aside and said, it's okay, let's just have a conversation. This doesn't have to go anywhere. And creating that safe place. At the end of our hour conversation, he filled out the information, he joined the group. I think when a man has been has been sexually assaulted as a child and has tried to bring that up before in a certain space and had that little sideways glance of that huge in him, it's like, uh-oh, disapproval, uh-oh, uh, alert, 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 goes into self-defense, emotional self-defense. And I think there's a lot of series of those. Men are, from what we've heard from our groups, you know, I gotta take care of my family. If people at my job found out that I'm here, I could lose my job. Um, I've told my wife, but my kids don't know. Or all kinds of, of different things. And one of the biggest concerns men have that are gonna go through the program is who are the other people that are gonna be with me in that program? And I said, say, I don't know ex exactly who there are because there still could be people we're going to see. I don't do all the interviews. I say, they're exactly like you. They expect confidentiality. They're nervous. They, they, they're carrying this weight that they want to let go. And they want a place of not unconditional non-judgment, compassion, and empathy. Those are the men that are going to be in your group because that's our goal when we're doing the first interview is to make sure that those people are ready to start telling their story in a way that's respectful to the other stories coming up. We do that in the best way we can. So I'd say yes and no. I don't really know if it's harder or not for men. I've received a signal that we have 10 minutes. If I interpreted the signal, eight minutes, OK. I thought I saw two more fingers, sorry. Um, so I'm going to ask one uh, really brief uh, final question, and then we'll open it up. Um, and it's just this, how do you as, um, I know you don't like the word leader, and so facilitator, manager, in your case, executive director. <laughs> Some of that too, I'm sure. How do you not get overwhelmed? I mean, just in the last tw less than 24 hours, we've heard so many stories that can easily overwhelm you. Um, how do you, and I guess this is kind of a personal question, if you don't mind sharing, how do you continue to be an advocate for individuals that you work with and for these issues in general without just getting totally overwhelmed and, and um, paralyzed with the sheer magnitude of the, the problem? Because I'm just getting started here, so I really need to know. <laughs> um, my, the reason I think I was asked to apply for the Gatehouse director job from art was because I've had 20 years of Shaolin Kung Fu training. Um, how I deal with that, if it gets too much, I go into the garden, I go, what? And I start screaming and running around and doing martial arts stuff. Uh, but also meditation really incorporates, I do something called Badwa Jin, they do it in the, 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 gar uh, the, the temple every day. We've, I've had a Shaolin monk come to our club in Brampton and teach this. I think it's really important that you reflect and go inward. I won't go too much in because I know we, have, uh, we don't have much time. Uh, but to do things for yourself, to go inside. I believe the heart has infinite capacity. So what really, when I go into every intake, before I come into every meeting like this, I try to connect with my heart. Because if you're using your head, you will get so tangled up in this stuff. It will start, you'll, you'll start to go, what? I can't, it, it will get too much. You'll get vicarious trauma, compassion, fatigue, all of those things. But if you go into a place, you do nothing well, which means that you let that person find their own way through leading questions and listen with non-judgment, empathy, compassion. And that's a heart center thing. So I'd say with everybody who's doing this work is just to connect to your heart before you, you do it and to make sure that you're, you're feeling your heart beating. <laughs> Number one, if you don't call 911, but um, just to connect with your heart. Well, I think that's an ongoing struggle. 
Um, and I think it's going to be different for everyone who goes into it. Um, it's important to um, uh, to be be conscious and aware of when you are starting to get in your in over your head and pull back, put the oxygen mask on yourself. Um, I think uh, my motivation is and my approach is different. I think because because I myself am a, a child torture victim and a stalking victim, um, and most of the people and it, it's an interesting thing. Most of the people in our group who've had the worst experiences are the or the classically worst um, uh, are pretty calm about it. Actually, they don't get ruffled. You can talk about all kinds of things. Nothing really bothers them. They laugh a lot. But they are resolute. They are resolute. So, so for me, I think it's about um, what drives me is wanting to correct things, to correct the balance, and even just a sense of getting justice for for my own situation. Because my own situation is so far out of the norm. All, all, literally all of the survivor services I went to didn't have a place for me. I was, I was. Um, uh, and there's some really awful experiences. So I realized then that there are a lot of people like me who don't necessarily fit within the cracks. And and starting to do that, so for me, it's it, it tends to be more intellectual because partly it's recognizing patterns. Oh, aha, oh, this, oh, this, look at this. Like, for instance, um, the people in the group that connect to each other, you get these wonderful opportunities there was a, a woman in the group, and I'll, I'll be careful because I don't want to share anybody's story, but um, she's Muslim, um, you know, wears a hijab. Um, her parents kidnapped her um, on the outside and, and had these real difficulties with the services because everybody just saw her hijab. She actually related to Daniel's experience because of the, the, the idea of kidnapping. Um, and so sometimes it's really, really frustrating. And, and, and you can also have really difficult people who come in who are problematic, who, who, who use their victimhood as an, ex, as an excuse to hurt other people. So it's really important. That's actually the biggest drain that I've found. So we, we actually employ, there's a book called The No Asshole Rule, which is by Harvard Business Press. That's what we use as our philosophy. Um, but I think it's trying to get all of the stories out and getting the connections. And when you see these unorthodox pairings it just gives you it's like oh it feels so wonderful to see people and get their own strengths so I think it's important to be careful and watch um, not allow so just because someone has had trauma it's not an excuse for them to traumatize other people um, and so we really stringently apply that rule so you know whether they're they may not be ready or they may intentionally be wanting to, to harm. So uh, we're very, very careful about safety. We, we stress safety, um, put the oxygen mask on. And then after that, it's, it's, pretty, it's pretty magical to watch what happens when people can open up. Terrific. Uh, thank you both, uh, Brad and Anne, for uh, uh, sharing your, your stories and your wisdom. And I'm sorry that I've monopolized all of our time, but this was such an engrossing conversation. Hope uh, you all enjoyed it. Are there any quick questions? We don't have a lot of time, but will you both be sticking around for a little bit, yeah, at least throughout the, through the lunch? At least an hour after lunch? Beautiful. Uh, so you'll have some time with them if you can't ask a question now. D Daniel. Yes, I have one. Mm -hmm. I have one question that might. Well, first of all, I commend your resources. I, I think it's amazing that uh, uh, males are being addressed for their concerns and for their trauma concerns. I think what, you know, uh, something resonated with me when, when you mentioned that someone came in of the transgender nature, came in with trauma concerns. My thought is why not disengage the um, associations to things? You know, like we describe certain situations connected with people. Oh, here's a man who experienced this. Here's a woman who experiences this. But why not just look at the pain itself and not try to focus on, you know, how people can relate to each other, how people can trust each other. Trust is, is, is respected.
that's, that's really, really we just a really couple more minutes point. just to finish this. And that's, and that's, I mean, that's what we do is we work on the trauma. However, the entry point can be different. So if we've, if we've done something unknowingly to trigger somebody to stop that conversation from happening, then we just have to look at different ways. I agree with you 100%. What you're saying is a very high spiritual principle. Let's drop the, the pronouns and let's look at the, let's look at the trauma. That's what we do at the gate, is look at the trauma. But the entry point for, for this particular community we found, we can stop it right at the door. We can cr we create a feeling of unsafety with the way we were greeting. So can we greet in a way that's more encompassing? That's the only thing. I agree with you 110%. And that's that's where it can be frustrating sometimes. It's like, you know, let's move, let's move past that. Let's move to your spirit. Let's move to that place in you that can heal all of these wounds. We know how to get there. And it's not easy. It's that darkness that's going through that valley. But if you're willing to go there, we're here to support you in that. But so I like really great statements. I agree with you. All right. I'm afraid there's no more questions, but again, both of our panelists will be here um, for at least some time. So round of applause for Brad and Anne. I realize not all of you were here last night. You may not know about the Center for Men and Families, which is the agency that I'm representing. So because we're out of time, I'll just encourage you to come see me at the table over there. We do offer a breadth of services uh, for men uh, related to trauma, but also related to family issues. Uh, related to uh, other kinds of emotional hardships that uh, men are likely to go through. So thank you. I've been given the uh, unholy job of cutting everything off in the middle when you really had so much more to talk about, I'm sure. Um, unfortunately, we, we, it's 12.02 and um, we need, lunch is on your own or you, there's snacks over there if that'll sustain you. There's a Tim Hortons right here, there's a Starbucks right here. Um, I don't know if there's a cafeteria. There's a cafeteria upstairs. There's two upstairs in the same building. Oh, wonderful. So back here at 1 o'clock, we have to start sharp at 1 o'clock. We've got a full afternoon. And um, so please, please try to be back as soon as you can. Thanks again, Anne. Thanks, Brad, so much. Thank Thanks, Justin. Thank you. That went very, very well. Yeah, yeah. Thank you, Brad.